Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. I'm really excited for this video. I've come to North Augusta in uh, South Carolina. For those of you who don't know, uh, Augusta sits on kind of both sides in the North Augusta parts in, in South Carolina with uh, Ted Stevens, uh, who is just, this is a person I it somehow m missed meeting, but uh, his name comes up in any conversation where plants have been named in the last many, many uh, decades. Uh, so I'm really excited to meet Ted. Can you tell me something about your nursery? Uh, well, we've been in business since 1973. Uh, I majored in Horton College and uh, love plants. I showed people when I was three years old my little garden, my, my nursery in my in my sand pile. And, uh, but nonetheless, I, I majored in it, love it, love coming to work every morning. I'm, 76 and I'm not planning to retire in time soon so <laughs> okay all right so explain the name of your nursery all right nurseries Caroliniana well Caroliniana is a botanical term meaning right. from the Carolinas in Latin for instance if you take prunus Caroliniana which is Carolina cherry right. that means like a prune from the Carolinas so we that's why Caroliniana follows the nurseries it, it's it's modifying the, the nursery so nurseries Caroliniana so that's where it came from people often confuse it believe you me, <laughs> right, right. a lot of times around here, just say like Carolina, but no, it's Carolina-iana. Oh, that's, a, that, that's a, there was a, it's a, it's a great, it's a great name. How, how long have you been in business here? Since 1973. So you're coming Not at this years? particular spot. Our families had, had this land for hundreds of years, but uh -huh. anyway, uh, we've been around here for ages. And, uh, but we have retail in town, but about 20 years ago, mm -hmm. they took our parking lot for a road expansion. So we just moved out here where we were already growing plants. Uh -huh. And uh, it's kind of hard to find, but once people have found it, now we're, we're, we're doing better, so. Okay, uh, that's, uh, that's awesome. We'll get to some uh, in information about his uh, mail order business. So you can, you can actually get these interesting things uh, sent to you. Uh, but we're gonna talk about some plants uh, as we go as well. We wanna talk yeah. about Osmanthus yeah. is your- yeah, our, our number one selling group of plants, we might say, uh -huh. are tea olives or Osmanthus. Osmanthus being the Latin term, the, uh, for the genus, and it, it's a big group. The most famous of these are what we're looking at right here, Osmanthus fragrance. And of course, you get the name fragrance, uh, meaning fragrant, and uh, this is our number one seller. We sell probably about up to 35 or 40 different uh, selections of Osmanthus, not all fragrance, but, but right. some other species. Mm -hmm. This is our number one seller, it's Fodingu. F O D I N G Z H U. Fodings U. Yeah, this is just so, sorry to interrupt you. This is super helpful to me. I have one of these at the house. I've been planning on shooting a video. I was about to mispronounce it, so I'm, I'm very. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah we, we got the original spelling is F U. Uh huh. Uh, dings U. Fu Dings U. But then we right. were informed by some uh, Chinese graduate students uh -huh. from the University of Georgia that know it's Fo Dings U. Matter of fact, it means pearls on Buddha's head. We're told <laughs> right. by the Chinese. Uh, okay. It makes wads of flowers. I always used to say, with tea olives, mm -hmm. you can smell them before you can see them. Yes, Here's true. one of the selections that you can see it before you can smell it, because it is showy, actually, in flower. It, it is just amazing. This is our number one selling selection of them. Like I said, we sell numerous different ones. Uh, this one has its limits as far as cold hardiness. Mm -hmm. uh, probably zone 7B. Uh, anything above that, you might on severe winters, you might get damage. But uh, and, and and people might wonder why is it called tea olive? Well, it's in the olive family. Mm -hmm. I didn't know this was used in tea till I was a grown man. Nevertheless, I always wondered why it was tea olive. Uh, one of our customers from uh, San Francisco, yeah. uh, uh, a Chinese lady, she informed us that you take the blooms, you dry them and you put them in your tea when you uh -huh. uh, make your tea and it makes it have a better fragrance. So anyway, it's the state tree or state flower of China. And so it, it's very much adored by them. Yeah, and in, in a place where they have a, lot of, they have a lot of options to choose from. I had, when I had retail space at the farmer's market in Raleigh, I was, I was, I was telling you, that was just uh, any Chinese person that came into the space. They didn't know they could grow them. Like they had yeah. moved to a place right. and they were in Raleigh and they didn't know they could grow them. And like, this is so exciting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So let's move to something else. Okay. So the nursery started wholesale. Exactly. Okay. And you're coming up on 50 years. Well, really, it that. started retail and then we started wholesale because I couldn't find plants I wanted to sell right. that uh, were available right. on the market. Gotcha. And so that slowly grew. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, and so we, we still got our retail 
and but we've added mail order. We've got a good website now, whereas before we didn't, and uh, and it's really made the mail order. We shipped to all 50 states. We have shipped to some foreign countries, but we've stopped that pretty much. It's so much paperwork anymore that's shipped uh, internationally. Right. That we ship to all of our, well, 48. We do ship. We have shipped some to uh, uh, Hawaii, but that's a little more trouble too. Right. Yeah, I would, ima I would imagine. I would imagine shipping out here. So we've come over to some Edgeworthia. Yeah, this is an Edgeworthia. Now Edgeworthia is, you know, I, I actually heard about it through J.C. Ralston at the uh -huh. Ralston Arboretum. Right. And I can't remember, probably back in the 80s. Yes. And uh, it, it is really an incredible plant. It's in the Daphne family, the same family with, with Daphne, which people have a hard time growing. This plant is amazingly resilient. We've had customers from Jacksonville, Florida, and I have a customer in Massachusetts that lives out on Martha's Vineyard. Both have sent me pictures of how well they do there. Right. And and so uh, the neat thing about it, it's a winter bloomer. I love winter blooming plants, especially when you get tired of the cold here. But it starts flowering for us generally about mid to late January, opens slowly over a period of time, fragrant yellow umbels of, of small flowers in, in clusters. And uh, as, as they open, they open on the outside of the cluster and then go move toward the inside of the cluster. But the fragrance carries quite well. It has kind of a Narcissus-like fragrance. Yes. I do have one selection I have made that was a seedling, and we named it Heaven Scent because it has a completely different fragrance, and, and it's really much sweeter, more of the rubrum lily-like fragrance to it. Really, really neat. But it, it's got several interesting qualities about it. Notice it branches in threes. I don't know any other thing that branches like in threes. It's very resilient. It, it will not break, you know. It, you can almost tie it on a knot. And um, it, it roots from hardwood cuttings or softwood cuttings. We take cuttings about late August, early September and root it then. And then the flower buds set uh, in late summer and you, you'll know what blooms you're going to get the next spring. Here it's happier in some shade. Now we grow these in full sun, but we water twice a day in the heat of the summer. Right. Uh, other places you could grow it in more sun further north. So it's extremely cold hardy. It, it's amazed yeah. me at how cold hardy it is. Yeah, uh, zone, you're, what are you, zone eight? eight I'm zone here? eight, about you're mid zone, zone eight here. Mid zone, okay, so we're seven yeah. B in Raleigh on the edge of eight. And ours is in the full sun until maybe two o'clock in the afternoon. Right. And it's, it's just in the shade after that. And, it's, and you yeah. might see them wilting at that time of day. That doesn't usually hurt them. Just, they right. do like uniform moisture, but, but it is really a, a wonderful plant for winter interest. It is. So we're big fans of uh, telling the stories of plants. And right. so this one's got a great story. Yeah, this is a tea plant, Camellia sinensis. A lot of people don't realize that tea is a camellia. Okay. Well, anyway, I spotted this little plant as a seedling in. I uh, got Yokoi's garden in uh, just outside of Tokyo in Japan, and I pointed it out to him, and he told me, oh, why, why don't you take it? And I said, oh, I wouldn't think of taking it. Well, Dr. Yokoi's world-renowned. He's one of the foremost world authorities on uh, plant pigments, and uh -huh. uh, he's written a number of books. Well, anyway, I refused to take it, but about 10 days later, we were washing our plants to go to the inspection station at a nearby nursery and he drives up in the yard. He dug the plant up, washed its roots, uh -huh. like we can't bring anything back with soil on it, and, uh, and handed it to me in a Ziploc bag. So I named it Silver Dust. It may have another name in Japan. if it's. Right. Yeah, I know it's gotten started over there, but it's a really unique plant. It is. And, and, it, and it comes, I have grown some from seed and it comes fairly true from seed. But sometimes the growth comes out almost totally white and then it slowly turns green as it hardens off. So it's a really unique plant. Of course, the flowers on Camellia sinensis are not real huge. Right. They're not overly large, only about an inch, inch and a half across. Uh, they bloom in the fall, yeah. just about like Sasanquis do. But it's mm -hmm. real cold hardy. Yeah, uh, zone seven, yeah. cold hardy. It yeah. is really one of the more cold hardy species of Camellias, actually. Yeah, wow. Okay, this is another one of our very popular varieties, Rick Shang Gi. Now, the name in Chinese <clears throat> translates to something to the effect of always fragrant. Um, I gave one to my one of my best uh, horticulturists here, Peggy. She took it home and planted it and came back in a year and said, Ted, this thing's flowered in every month except August. 
So we've decided that the always fragrance means it's always in flower. Now we're told that this plant, the one we've looked at, Fodengzhu, and then another one we will look at, uh, Tangjiang Taiga, are the three most popular in China. Uh, but this one has a long blooming period, just as fragrant, but extremely long blooming period. And here again, I got this one fascinating that one of my customers who is a deaf customer, we always communicate on emails and text messages, and he had this plant which we had been looking for for years, and he was in Dallas. So I got him to overnight some cyan wood in January, and I grafted it because it's almost impossible to root an osmanthus off of an old plant. You have to have what we call juvenile growth, new growth off, to a, off of a smaller plant, not new growth after an old plant. Uh, so, and he did that and we were able to get started from that, but it is quite a good plant and very popular. Uh, we just started offering it a year ago and it's been very popular. We can scarcely keep it. Okay, here's a, one of the better variegated plants, I think, on the face of the earth. Uh, this is variegated turmeric. Yes, you're right. It's the, um, the, the herb, uh, the root is used. It's hardy in zone seven. I've seen it growing in Raleigh. Has one of the best variegations of any plant I have ever seen. Uh, we will overwinter these in the cans in the greenhouse. We won't let them freeze through and through because it would kill the plant otherwise. And so it is really one of the better plants that you can plant. It's late to come up in the spring, probably. If you hear late April, early May, it starts popping. But when it starts popping, it goes very, very fast. It flowers down low, kind of under the foliage. Uh, unlike a lot of the gingers, which flower in, from terminals, these flower down low. And, and it's really one of the best ones on the market. And uh, I highly recommend it. This is chalkbark maple, Acer leucodermi. Uh, it's a local native, but it stretches from uh, North Carolina through the Southeast to East Texas in very uh, scattered locations. It's not universal anywhere like a red maple is. But it's like a miniature sugar maple. It grows about the size of a dogwood and it has some of the most brilliant fall color of any tree in this area, period. Uh, but it will vary from plant to plant, like from brilliant yellow to brilliant orange to red, so you can get anything in between and they can all be growing right next to one another. But it's a very easy to grow plant. It is happiest for us if it's under an understory plant not grown out in full hot blazing sun, but further north I'm sure it would do fine there. Okay, this is another one of our Osmanthus fragrance cultivars of the three top ones we sell. This is Tangjiang Taiga. Uh, the translation into English is something like double heaven fragrance, and it is reputed to be the most fragrant of all tea olives, and so that's why it is so extremely popular very vigorous, large grower. It has the unique characteristic of the flowers will come out at different times of the year with different colors. Some, it'll be a clear yellow, some pure white, sometimes it's almost orange. So it's really quite variable in that respect, but it is an extremely popular plant uh, with our clientele. All right, so I asked the question, you have a lot of interesting woody ornamentals. And so I go to a lot of places, it's either woodies or, you know, herbaceous, herbaceous. perennial things, that kind of thing. I asked you this, the question and well, give me your response. Well, I'm a plant lover, uh -huh. unfortunately. <laughs> right, unfortunately. I, I have herbaceous and woodies and I have right. a lot of both. Right. Uh, so I could take a good while. I've got them in different locations to show you some of them. Right. But yeah, this is a, this is a, uh, uh, a plant, another tea olive, but this is a yellow flowering tea olive. Wow. The botanical is Osmanthus fragrance thunbergii, subspecies thunbergii. Uh, one of my employees says this is her favorite fragrance, uh. so she has them planted all around her house and in her garden. And it's a good clear yellow. Uh, there are several named species. Now normally I might mention this. One good thing about tea olives is once the leaf hardens off, it's deer resistant. Right. But look, mm -hmm. probably last night, mm -hmm. the deer nipped this tender new growth. After it hardens off, it won't. They won't, they won't touch it. 
Another neat thing about this selection, though, is it's more cold hardy than the whites. Right. Uh, the yellows and the oranges are quite cold hardy. And this one has deep serrations. That's just one people say, how can you tell them apart? Well, I can generally tell them apart by looking at the leaf, right. uh, even if they're not labeled. But I wouldn't want to trust my, my sight to that degree. But nonetheless, you can feel the leaf is very thick and heavier textured than the white ones. And so the orange, which is Orantiacus subspecies, mm -hmm. and this one, Thunbergia, is the yellow. And, and uh, so a lot of people choose it for its fragrance. And it's probably our fourth number one seller of, of all. So Ted, you said you have several uh, citrus that are hardy here. Right. Uh, this is one, we've about decided that grapefruit is one of the hardier species of citrus. Uh, and this one was found in a, a garden here in Augusta and uh, had been there for about 40 years. And the tree was about 16 feet high and about 12 feet across. And when I got fruit from it, out of six fruit, there were only there was only one seed. Uh, so, but it's not completely seedless. But it is uh, ha has a pink flesh. But it has proven hardy here. Now we won't overwinter it out here in full sun during the winter, but we will move it in a cold frame. Uh, but it is has proven cold hardy for that long uh, here in Augusta. So we've named it uh, Augusta Hardy Pink. Uh, no other imaginative name than that, but it is quite vigorous. We root it from cuttings. Uh, you can grow them from uh, seed, and they come fairly true from seed, but it produces so few seed, we just grow it from cuttings. And, and these are all rooted cuttings from that original tree. This is one of the more unique tea olives that we grow. It is a foliage grown more for its foliage than for its flower. This is Kinan Gife. Uh, it comes out with brilliant pink new growth, now this is uh, midsummer, so you don't see the extra flushes are not as pink, but the first flush in the spring. Then it transitions from completely hot pink to white. Now some of these leaves right here, you almost see that, and then it goes from white to green. So it, it's a beautiful plant. Now it does have white fragrant flowers, but it's grown more for its foliage than for its for its flowers, but it's really a unique plant. I think this will be the next southern substitute for red tip, which got wiped out by Entomosporium leaf spot some years back. Nobody knows what red tip fortinia is anymore because of that. But this one has all the plus qualities. I don't know if you've ever smelled the flower of red tip, but it's horrible. Uh, it's not very fragrant at all. Matter of fact, very unfragrant, malodorous, if we say it right. Uh, then it is susceptible to disease, which this isn't. Then it has fragrant flowers contrasted to the others. And uh, it's fairly deer resistant, except like we mentioned before, the tender new growth, the deer might nip that, but once it hardens off, they completely leave it alone. So we've got an excellent uh, new substitute for red tip fortinia if someone likes a colorful hedge. This is a wonderful plant here. I'm particularly fond of plants in the lily family, and Liriope is one of my favorites. Well, this particular plant, I saw at the Atlanta Botanical Garden, and it had a bloom stalks over my pocket, huge. And uh, I asked them uh, what it was. They didn't know for sure. Uh, this went on for several years, and finally they decided they'd throw it in the compost heap because it was unidentifiable. Well, I got it uh, from that. And Barry Yinger, who at the time worked for the National Arboretum, was collecting plants in South Korea, and he was collecting seed from hardy camellias on an island off the North Korean coast, even though it belonged to South Korea. And he and his guide came upon a grove, uh, a mass of planting of this in the wild, and he stripped seed from it, sent it all over America to different botanical gardens, and when he was here one day, since they couldn't identify it at the Atlanta Botanical, I asked him if he happened to know what it was, and he says, yes, he lit up. He said, yes, for sure. He said, that's a plant he and his guide collected off the coast of North Korea on this island. And he showed it to me because I've been there and taught about five years ago, rather fascinating. But nonetheless, this is a, an extremely cold-hardy plant. Realize it gets 20 below zero there. 
So this plant is that cold hardy. But the unique thing about it is I have measured flower stalks. Now this one is just starting as you see right here. I have measured flower stalks 57 inches high. So it is extremely fascinating with the height of its flowers. And the foliage is fairly tall too, but this is about the extent of the foliage. It doesn't get much over about 16 to 18 inches, whereas the flower stalk gets up to four to five feet. So it is a rather fascinating plant, and uh, I'm really fond of it. We've named it uh, Korean Giant uh, because of its uh, original source, and I've actually sent plants back to North Korea to the school where I taught over there. So you, you, I heard this story. I heard this story from Tony. You, you, taught, you were teaching in North Korea. How does a person end up teaching in North Korea? It's a very long story, but most people don't realize there's a university sure, right I'll, in the I'll, middle. I'll hold this for you. There's you a can, university yeah. right in the middle of Pyongyang, the capital of North Korea, called Pyongyang University of Science and Technology. And uh, the gentleman that started it was approached by the North Korean government to start a university like this. And he said, I will start it under two conditions. I hire all the professors and they'll all be Christians. So this is how it started. And it's quite a large campus. It has about, probably about 1,500 students now, undergraduates and graduate school. And so they asked me to come over. And I would be, have come over since, but there's been, of course, the COVID situation, plus our State Department won't allow Americans to travel to North Korea uh, anymore. So... It was quite an experience, and I taught in the fall of 2016, and uh, very much enjoyed it. It's amazing how inquisitive the students were. My first question was, when I sat down and ate with them at the table, was, tell us about your mansion. <laughs> 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 That's funny. Okay, this is a variegated tea olive. I never knew such a thing existed, but Mark Wethington, who is the director of the Ralston Arboretum, at NC State in Raleigh, uh, brought a friend of his uh, here from China. And when he saw how many tea olives we were growing, he said, oh, I must show you what we have available in China. And he brought up a website with these pictures on it, and I nearly fainted. So Mark was able to get some from him, and we've gotten it started there. Actually, several selections of this, uh, but it comes out with gorgeous uh, white variegation. The new growth will be somewhat pink, and then it transitions to just the white and green. Uh, but it's really a wonderful plant. The flowers are white and fragrant, but it was definitely grown for its foliage effect rather than for the flowers. In the landscape, is this gonna be sun or shade? Because you're growing it in some shade. I think here. it's happier with a little high shade right. uh, over it. Uh, we've grown it in full sun. Now further north, it might take more sun, right. but we have moved ours into some tall, under tall pines right here where it performs better. With, with this many specialty plants, um, you, uh, you must be, I mean, it, it must be very complicated to, uh, everything's gonna be rooted different, rooted at different it, times, rooted at, you know. I could it, show you our propagation house. We grow maybe 500 different things which we're rooting at one time, which means at the same time you're giving something too much water, you're not giving something else enough. Right. So you have to find this happy medium. Right. Uh, we, we see a lot of nurseries with, you know, I, I think I can't remember how many uh, JCs to say something about how many uh, woodies, you know, that were made up 95% of all of them because they're all easy, easier to root. Right. Can be rooted together, grown together. When you start doing what you're doing. Yes. And it, what other, you know, uh, other specialty places are doing. Every plant, every plant needs a really special is. formula. That's a very good point to make. Yeah, Very right, good right, and it ends up, it, and there's additional cost in that. Yes, it is, it is. Right. And you don't have as high a percentage rooting as you would if you could relegate one house right. to one selection. Right, <laughs> and you find yourself as the guy who is figuring out how to root it. Exactly. You're the guy yeah. figuring out how to root it. There's nobody you can call. Yep, you're right, right. Yeah. you're right. You have to do a lot of trial and error, right. uh, switching hormones, rooting medium, a lot of different things that you can vary right. uh, that we have to try to experiment with. Okay, here's one of the best plants for the south, but I'm finding they're far more cold hardy than we once suspected them to be, uh. are the Elysiums. This is the uh, Japanese anise, Elysium anisatum. Uh, here are two cultivars. Here's an old uh, variegated cultivar that we brought back and was rather cheap. 
uh, when we purchased it in Japan. Here's the newest one here, Kogane Fuji. And don't ask me to translate it, but nonetheless, it's a newer selection. We brought it was infinitely more expensive. Both of these are on our website. Uh, but the neatest thing about Elysiums are they're deer resistant. Yes. Deer don't touch them. Uh, I've never seen them eat so much as a bite a piece of a leaf on them. Right. Now, but I, Michael Durr always made the statement, the minute you make a rule of thumb with a plant, they'll make a liar out of you. <laughs> yeah, they but, will. but this is a fascinating plant. Beautiful white flowers, which don't show up very well against this variegated foliage, but nonetheless, really, really neat plants, easy to grow. Now, Anisatum likes the shade. Don't give it, it will take filter sun, but right. don't put it in full sun. It's not happy there at all. We grow the straight species, and then we have the other one, uh, Purple Glaze, which has the purple new growth. And uh, all of these are super plants, and easy to grow, and like we say, deer resistant. That's the biggest plus of all for them. Right, I'm, a bit, I'm an Elysium collector. I'm taking this one home. You guys will see this one in the, uh, in the garden uh, uh, back in Raleigh. One thing about our native, our southeastern um, native Elysium, every single time I plant one, it's in a full wilt for like a year. Yeah, they're drought tolerant, like right. extremely drought tolerant. But that first year, I've seen them. You've got to take, you got to, you do. You got to give them some extra Pour water, some extra love. Once they seem to break in, mm -hmm. break through that, you yeah. know, they're just the most drought tolerant thing in the world. There was a plant symposium in Raleigh a couple weeks ago, and uh, there was a rare plant auction, and I bid on this Solomon seal and won it. Uh, Steph is a big, uh, Stephanie's a big giant uh, Solomon Seal fan, so I knew I was buying it for her as a present. And I've come here, you're the person who donated it. <laughs> that's right, that's, that's right. That's funny. that's funny. One of my favorite plants, I, I mentioned before when we were talking about the giant liriope, yeah. uh, how much I love the lily family. And I, the Japanese are very proud of their plants when something first comes on the scene. And this was one of them. I paid $350 for a single little stem about that size <laughs> back probably up to 2004, wow. which that's when $350 was $350. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, uh, we've slowly built up numbers. We're offering it for sale. Some people might wonder, well, why is it more than the others? And I said, well, that's why. Yeah, it costs a little more. <laughs> but it's fairly vigorous and, and does quite well. Of course, they're... Shade perennials, but one of the best shade perennials. And I have it in my garden at home, and I haven't had trouble with voles eating my polygonatums. This is what these are. So I'm not sure if voles, somebody might inform us that yeah, appetite yeah, right. goes as far as polygonatums or not. But right. so far, fingers crossed, I haven't had any trouble with that, but it's a beautiful plant. It is, it really is striking. I'll link their website uh, down below. Guys, at any given time, you have, you said a thousand probably a thousand different plants available. And if they're pictured on there, uh -huh. we're working on getting numbers back up. The right. reason they're unavailable, we're just sold out at the moment. But woody plants are not like perennials, or herbaceous plants, you can't right. produce them overnight. Right. Uh, but we try to keep liners coming along so that we can shift them up yeah. as soon as we go out of another, uh, another lot. Hey, and, I, always uh, had the, I always had that with retail, doing with woody plants. They, you know, I sold them and they go, we're going to have some more tomorrow. Like exactly. I stamp them out someplace, you got some stamper. It doesn't, it doesn't work that way. It takes not like a little nails. While. No, and, and, and things you have are really you know, specialized uh, as well. Exactly. We've come to the land of uh, Japanese. Ardesia. These are Ardesias. Now, Ardesias in Japan are really quite the thing because they have shows. This is Ardesia wow. japonica. They will have shows for just Ardesia japonica, but we also grow Ardesia crispa and Ardesia cronata. But this is a ground cover Ardesia, and they have numerous forms. We probably now have over 50 cultivars uh, of these little ground cover Ardesias. They produce beautiful pink flowers and brilliant red berries through, through the winter. So you can use them as pot plants. Uh, this is Miho no Matsu, a uh, beautiful golden crown, I think is a trademark name for it. Mm -hmm. uh, Miho no Matsu means something like Miho pine. This is Amanagawa, and it's amazingly stable, being so variegated yeah, and right. contorted looking. Uh, but Amanagawa means Milky Way in Japanese. So you can see how uh, it develops that name, or, or they give it. You find a number of plants that are variegated in Japan that have the name Amanagawa. 
and then well, this one is uh, Ito Fukurin. This one's probably been in the country longer than any of the other variegated forms. One of the first ones ever brought here years ago, decades ago. Uh, but these are both here are quite new, and I, I introduced these probably uh -huh. early 2000s. They're, they're fantastic and underused. I think so plants. too. Yeah. The, the only thing about using them as a pot plant, be careful about mites. Mites love to get under the leaves, so take them outside periodically and just hose them down. Right. Try to get under the foliage as much as you can, or you might have to spray them with something. But nonetheless, they're easy as they can be to grow. They spread by underground rhizomes, and right. they root quite easily, too. So you're doing them from rooted cuttings? We do them from rooted cuttings, divisions. right. Uh -huh. But if we somebody did. had one, they could probably... You could divide it. You could do... They're right. just very easy to propagate. And nice. Really nice. Well, thank you for giving us your time today, uh, Ted. Uh, this is a place that's been on my uh, list uh, to come, and I wanted to, show, I wanted to show this off to you guys. Again, this is... Ted is one of those people, you know, like J.C. Ralston's name came up earlier in this conversation. In any place I go, you know, Ted named it. Ted knows where it came from. Ted, something Ted. So this one was exciting for me. Well, good. Thank yeah. you, Jim. Appreciate it. Thank you.